So uh, one of the discussion questions I want us to think about uh, when reading this uh, short story um, is the motif of uh, fire. Uh, in particular, uh, Jimmy Cross sets fire to uh, his photographs of Martha and the letters, and he's going to dis uh, or get rid of uh, his pebble. So all the things that remind him of Martha. Uh, so following Ted Lavender's death, uh, there's this sort of almost a symbolic uh, burning that occurs uh, when uh, Jimmy Cross uh, lights, uh, destroys all of these remnants of uh, Martha that he's been carrying around with him. Uh, so it's kind of a symbolic moment, uh, uh, marks a shift in his uh, character. And uh, the act of setting fire to those things that he once carried as precious, uh, it really marks uh, a shift in terms of uh, him giving up some of that innocence, uh, naivety, uh, childishness uh, that he had uh, holding on to this relationship. And then he's going to embrace and uh, take up that uh, sort of uh, manly duty. So it's rather a, you know, a sad transition or transformation that he has to make uh, in order to um, fulfill his duty as a soldier. Uh, and by burning those photographs and letters or photos of Martha, it's kind of a symbolic uh, letting go of who he once was, um, of the past, and trying to uh, become a, a hard, tough, uh, more disciplined soldier. So he has to give up something, sacrifice parts of his life in order to uh, become the man that he wants to become a soldier uh, and uh, there's some uh, the last kind of uh, pages of the short story so on page 22 um, he is burning the photos of Martha and this is after he has sort of collapsed into tears uh, so the tears themselves are kind of interesting as well when you think about uh, masculinity but to cry, uh, there's sort of this implicit rule of being uh, masculine that, you know, boys aren't supposed to cry. Uh, you're not supposed to show your feelings, uh, especially sadness and, you know, the emotional display of crying is sort of uh, viewed as emasculating or it's too feminine. You know, it's, it speaks of uh, emotional uh, weakness or fragility. Uh, so to, the fact that he cries is uh, something um, that the other men think that it's about, uh, you know, his sadness for Ted Lavender, but really uh, on page 17, we have him, he says he's grieving for Ted Lavender, but mostly it was for Martha and for himself because she belonged to another world, which was not quite real. And because she was a junior in Mount Sebastian College in New Jersey, a poet and a virgin and uninvolved and because he realized she did not love him and never would. So just as much as, you know, as he's mourning for Ted Lavender, he's also kind of mourning for this lost love, uh, the fact that Martha doesn't love him uh, the same way that he loves her. Crying over love, uh, it seems, you know, conventionally that would be something that uh, we'd view as more feminine or womanly. Uh, and here we have a soldier uh, displaying uh, his feelings. And in this sense, Tim O'Brien is really sort of countering or challenging uh, our notions of uh, a soldier. And he's really making uh, the soldiers, uh, including Jimmy Cross, more human, right? Uh, they're not perfect. They're not just this archetypal perfect soldier who uh, can go about killing without feeling anything. Uh, he's saying these are real people, real uh, men who have human emotions and uh, they, you know, feel the same feelings that uh, you and I would feel. So sadness, humiliation, shame, uh, it's part of the human condition, right? So he's saying uh, even these manly men, these guys who are all macho and tough and laugh and, 
and joke about dying. They, they're sort of burying or hiding or repressing a lot of their emotions, their sensitivity. Um, but it comes forth uh, in this moment when Jimmy Cross is crying about um, a girl. And uh, then we have uh, Jimmy Cross. So he's determined to leave behind his previous more sort of childish uh, sense of daydreaming about love and a woman he'll never uh, get. And then he is determined to perform his duties uh, without negligence. So on page 24, uh, it's kind of this uh, moment where he uh, disposes of his childishness, the daydreams, and now he's going to take on this very manly, soldierly role and uh, put his duties first ahead of any other concern. Uh, so again, he's going to cut off uh, his past uh, and who he was before. Uh, so on page 24, he would accept the blame for what had happened to Tev Lavender. He would be a man about it. He would look them in the eyes, keeping his chin level, and he would issue the new SOPs in a calm interpersonal tone of voice, a lieutenant's voice, leaving no room for argument or discussion. Um, so he is going to uh, hold himself with more authority, uh, more discipline, and fulfill his obligations as the lieutenant. And then on page 25, uh, Jimmy, uh, Lieutenant Jimmy Cross reminded himself that his obligation was not to be loved, but to lead. He would dispense with love. It was not now a factor. Uh, and if anyone quarreled or complained, he would simply tighten his lips and arrange his shoulders in a correct command posture. So this idea of posturing and holding yourself as a very sort of strict, stern uh, pose of soldierly uh, power and authority is very important uh, and relates to this idea of masculinity as well. Uh, so for these soldiers, manliness, masculinity is the same as being a very disciplined, very strict uh, soldier. And it's kind of sad in that sense because it is a loss, right? So that burning of Martha is also a sort of symbolic loss of uh, Jimmy Cross's previous self. Uh, he has to give up with love, um, has to give away his uh, innocence. Uh, so it's this kind of symbolic uh, shift in his character where um, the man that he was uh, is kind of cut off in a kind of blunt act of burning those photographs. So Ted Lavender's death marks uh, not just his own death, but it's sort of a symbolic death for Jimmy Cross as well, uh, in the sense that he uh, is no longer the naive, innocent sort of uh, boy that he once was, and he has no more illusions of uh, Martha's love, and he's going to carry himself uh, much more um, in a strict posture. So before we wrap up uh, with this story, uh, I want to just talk a little bit about uh, the, the representation of masculinity. Uh, and we've been talking about military masculinity uh, throughout the course, but in this uh, story, we have uh, Tim O'Brien writing about uh, how the soldiers uh, sort of had to uh, do away with their emotions, become hard and tough. And all this at the same time, they're sort of repressing their feelings, their fears. Uh, so he talks about having to uh, carry themselves, uh, posturing uh, and uh, sort of repressing any sort of uh, humiliation or shame or fear. So any feelings that are not conventionally associated with masculinity, uh, you would have to hide uh, or else face um, you know, being humiliated or uh, called names. Uh, so on pages 
18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Uh, we have Tim O'Brien sort of uh, reflecting on the masculine uh, guys, the postures of masculinity uh, that are part of the soldierly uh, pose. So he talks about uh, all this sort of posturing and the way that men would hide uh, their emotions. Uh, so rather than uh, talk about their real, their true fears about death, uh, they awkwardly um, you know, hide their true feelings. So if they cry, they have to cry in private. Uh, if they squeal or scream or show their fear in any visual way, uh, they face being you know, humiliated by uh, their peers, uh, other men, and they have to hold in their humiliation and shame. Uh, so on page 19, we have a speaker here saying, so there were numerous such poses. Some carried themselves with a sort of wistful resignation, others with pride or stiff soldierly discipline or good humor or macho zeal. They were afraid of dying, but they were even more afraid to show it. Uh, and then it talks about how they sort of joke about um, death. So they have other ways of uh, talking about death and they use all these different sort of euphemisms uh, rather than saying that somebody died. Uh, so it's all these ways that they sort of try to hide or take on a kind of, um, you know, how Jackson Katz, we talked about how he uh, says that men use a kind of uh, tough guys or my, a pose of macho-ness. Uh, this is sort of what I think of when I hear the word pose and postures. Um, so Tim O'Brien sort of suggesting that the soldiers have to uh, take up a kind of uh, macho facade uh, in order to hide their true feelings. And uh, so they have all this, um, so, so they're still feeling these feelings, but they have to hide them. Uh, so there's this common secret that all the soldiers share. Uh, this is page 20. Uh, they carried the common secret of cowardice barely restrained, the instinct to run or freeze or hide, and in many respects this was the heaviest burden of all, for it can never be put down. It required perfect balance and perfect posture. They carried their reputations. They carried the soldier's greatest fear, which was the fear of blushing. Men killed and died because they were embarrassed not to. It was what had brought them to the war in the first place. Nothing positive, no dreams of glory or honor, just to avoid the blush of dishonor. Uh, so we have their uh, acknowledgement that, um, you know, there is a certain burden or obligation or duty uh, to fulfill one's, uh, the, the expectations or roles associated with one's gender. Uh, in this case, we're talking, you know, 1969, uh, what are the expectations and roles uh, expected of young men? And it was uh, to serve one's country, uh, to be patriotic, to be heroic, um, to fulfill all those uh, sort of expectations of manliness that sort of society put on you uh, as a young man. Uh, so you had your reputation, and if you did not uh, fulfill these roles and expectations of masculinity, uh, then your reputation would be ruined, right? So uh, your peers, so this is sort of the homosocial enactment of masculinity uh, that Michael Kimmel talks about. So um, men uh, perform their masculinity for the approval of other men. Uh, so. They wear these it, on page 21 of uh, the story. So it says, by and large, they carried these things inside, maintaining the masks of composure. They sneered at sick call. They spoke bitterly about guys who had found release by shooting off their own toes or fingers. Pussies, they'd say, candy asses. It was fierce, mocking talk with only a trace of envy or awe, but even so the image played itself out behind their eyes. So here we have examples of the name calling and how your rep reputation would suffer if uh, you took sort of the easy way out 
um, which is not easy if you shoot off 